Once again, let me welcome you to Picks and Bones. I'm your host, Eric. I'm bringing you the best of Americana, red dirt, black dirt, good old American rock and roll, as well as some Carolina clay and just fine honky tonkin'. I want to give a huge shout out to Mike Carroll over at Audio Mass Audio and Video Solutions in Greenville, South Carolina. He uh, came in, did some upgrades to the studio, and hopefully you guys are enjoying a better and higher quality sound for this show. I would like to also invite everyone, and I mean everyone, to go to our Patreon page. Get in, folks. It's a, it's a way for you to help support this show like you do all the artists that you love. We have different levels, and with every level, you get something different. You know, you give 10 bucks a month, you're going to get a t-shirt out of it. You go, you know, there's $5 a month where you're going to just get access to behind-the-scenes uh, interviews, maybe some uh, music reviews. You know, you never know what you might end up with. And every bit of it is appreciated, and it helps keep this show going, just like you do for all the musicians that you love that you listen to on this show. And if you are listening and you're looking for sponsorship opportunities or looking to sponsor somebody, hey, reach out to me on my Facebook, Instagram, and or Twitter. You can uh, just look in our show notes and you'll be able to find all the links to everything that matters as far as this show goes. This week, I sat down with my man, Seth Jones. This guy is from Texas. He's as red dirt as they come. One of the most genuine down-to-earth people you're going to have the opportunity to meet. But not beyond that, he pays homage and respect to that old 90s country that we grew up loving and just couldn't get enough of. But not that, it's not just that, rather. He's a uh, one hell of a songwriter. So you guys, please enjoy. You know, I uh, the the little mini conversation we had before it started, I was thinking, damn, if if it's gonna go like this, it's gonna be great because I was loving that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. I just love. I mean, anybody that if you're gonna slow down long enough for me to have the opportunity to talk music with you, I'm absolutely going to do it. Mm-hmm. Or as my wife says, if anybody will stay stand still long enough to let you get into that conversation with them, they they just need to understand what's coming <laughs> yeah and i uh i mean i'm, I'm actually a, a huge introvert which is probably pretty common uh with songwriters but uh oh, absolutely people people do not like people i work with and people that i've you know, have done interviews with or even have a conversation with at a party they they do not believe me when i say i'm an introvert but you know it I've, I've researched it a lot because it's really weird to me how i am like this i'm a huge introvert but I can be outgoing too. Like it's mm-hmm. not that I don't want to, I'm not a misanthrope. I have been before, but I don't dislike people. I don't mind talking to people. It's just that I've always, uh, I've gotten my, I've derived my joy from, from myself, like from the inside. Like if you look at my, my toddler videos, 
you'll see me in the corner by myself playing with blocks and there's other kids like playing in the middle of the room. And that's just always been my natural preference. Like I can think better and more clear like that. But I mean, when I start talking, I could, man, I could talk, we could do a two parter today and it'd be an accident. <laughs> it would just happen. Right. And see, and, and that's, I love that. Cause I mean, anytime, you know, music is just great. And especially when you can start breaking down some fundamentals and everything, just like, you know, I was telling you before we really started rolling that, uh, you know, I've listened to your new album through multiple times now and, you know, your title track and you can, you, you allude to this, you know, once we get this, you know, going and everything, but man, this is like, it's that old school nineties country that we all grew up on and loved. I mean, it's got that, you've still got that red dirt to it. But you can also hear kind of little homages to like the, um, you know, King George himself and, you know, mm-hmm. these guys that have, that were kind of paving the way for everybody else to do it. And I mean, come on, let's, let's, where were you drawing from for this? Well, I, uh, I loved, for, first of all, thank you for listening several times. I appreciate that. But, uh, I, I loved the fact that Puzzle Man was the title track, and I wanted to put that first. I, I wanted that to be the for the forefront because that really sums me up as a writer. Because it, I am pretty complex, dude. You know, I've I've battled depression my whole life. I've you know so many ups and downs, and you know, it's depression's not just sadness; it's depression. Like yeah. nothing has to happen. It's a chemical reaction, and the things you love, you're no longer interested in, and it affects relationships and all that stuff. And I figured, like, I write songs about love. I write songs about d- disdain and angst. I write all sorts of songs, and uh, I figured, what better way to to lay the foundation of an album than puzzle man straight up telling everybody, Hey, you can't figure me out. I can't figure me out. So I figured that was, that's a, that was a good starting point. And, uh, as far as the question, where did I, what was I drawing from, man, believe it or not, I played rock and punk music for a long time. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, but I've always listened to, uh, I've listened to man, sublime, Old 97s, Ragweed, George Strait, 90s country, from 90s country to to metal. There's a band called Bayside. They're straight up like punk metal type stuff, and they've got the best angst hate songs you've ever heard. And I was into them for years. So like I I drew from everything really, but as far as the general sound of the album, I didn't have a big plan. But the musicians, the musicians I was working with kind of settled me down because I've made albums before that sound like punk, country, folk, like what the hell is this guy doing? And people don't respond great to that because they can't keep up, which is not an insult. It's it's actually an insult to me. (laughs) I couldn't I couldn't keep myself under control. But the musicians having that consistency there, that kind of kept it grounded a little bit. And I think my opinion and based on what people have been telling me, it kind of walks a line between 90s country and the uh, kind of independent red dirt type of country, you know, like uh, from from George Strait to Cody Jinks. Oh, yeah, of. absolutely. And, you know, and, and I've, I've got to really throw a kudos to you, sir. You're one of the first people to bring up old 97s. I love old 97s. And if anybody knows me, they know I'm a huge Turn by Troubadours fan. But uh, Doreen is one of the hottest songs I think anybody <laughs> has ever recorded. And, you know, both do such a great job on that. But, you know, seriously, major kudos to you for uh, being the first artist on the show to bring up old 97s. That, Man. that you showed me a deeper appreciation for music than than I think you realize. So. Well, let me tell you something about the old 97s. <clears throat> I, they may be my favorite band of all time, quite frankly, because I told you I did punk and country. I mean, oh, what yeah. the hell are the old 97s? <laughs> They're a punk and country type band, you yeah. know? Uh, I mean, they do all sorts of stuff. But they, the fact that they can rock out, play country, 
And all the while, Rhett Miller writes these lyrics that you can appreciate on the surface, but then you can just sit there and think about them. And he has so much skill to his – I mean he throws in he throws in so much that when I was an early songwriter, I didn't really get it. I just loved it. Mm -hmm. But now I get it now that I've written hundreds of songs. I'm thinking, man, he threw alliteration in there and then immediately went to something real sporadic. And that contrast really brings the verse out. And I didn't, I never knew that kind of stuff. I just, I was like, I love this song and I don't know why. But now I listen to it and I'm like, damn, Rhett, you did it again, buddy. <laughs> <clears throat> well, and there's certain, from a musician standpoint, there are certain notes and, you know, those occidentals that you can, you know, add in there, you know, with that are subtle, like a fiddle or whatever, that actually stirs that in somebody. That it goes beyond that helps punctuate that that feeling of if say if it's a, a sad song because I mean I know a lot of guys that's they've made their living on doing sad songs and you know depressive stuff because they're like this is who I am and mm -hmm. when you can pair that those lyrics with the perfect combination and those harmonies and those you know, really deep down melodies. That's when, and that's those ones like we were kind of talking about. If I hear a song, even the first time I hear it, if I get goosebumps, I know this is going to be a great song. I'm going to love this, this artist and this band. And, you know, surprisingly enough, there's so many people that are, that are just putting their heart and soul into it. And they're not guys, anybody that's nowhere near a record label. They're independent guys because they're and they're just like you. You're doing your own thing, and that as a as a musician myself, and as you know a lover of the genre, you know you have my utmost respect for that because that takes that takes a really different level of integrity to stand up and go. You know what? I'm going against the system. Yeah, and there's a there's a there's a, a balance beam you have to walk if you want to sustain yourself in that. Because if, if you, and I've thought about this a lot because I've gone through this crap. If you just play just the most crazy, whatever I want to play type stuff around and no one's, no one's digging it or like hardly, there's hardly anyone digging it. You literally run out of funding to release more stuff. I mean, absolutely. At some point, you have to make some sort of money, and that doesn't mean you have to sell out. You just got to find your crowd and then kind of give them what they want sometimes. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And the old 97s, they've managed to play, they, they've released albums that were pretty damn pop, like not straight up radio pop, but real, had lots of poppy sounds, mm -hmm. and they've released albums that were pretty damn punk. And uh, they've kind of done all sorts of stuff, but they found a big niche crowd. Like you could ask, you could randomly ask a million, a million random Americans who the old 97s are. And most of them have never heard of them, despite them being a band for 30 plus years. But the people that have heard of them, they love them and they spread the gospel and they buy their stuff. They go to their shows. So they found a way to be themselves and sustain themselves. And that's really the perfect situation. And there's, you know, and there's another band out there that's just like that, which is a uh, Southern culture on the skids. Don't know if you've ever heard of them, but these guys, they're popular across the whole Southeast and everything. They're a great band. They're been playing for 30 years. They play kind of, if you would, it's almost like a punk honky tonk country. That's, you know, you can definitely tell, you know, they're from, you know, East Coast. What I'm, what I'm ref lovingly referring to these days, to uh, our scene over here is we. Uh, this is this is red clay country now, and red clay spread all the way across the country. <laughs> but and, and you know, if you really want to look things historically, but we won't even go down that rabbit hole. But with that red clay feel, I mean, they'll bring somebody up on stage every show. And they're going to rub fried chicken on somebody's belly. I have been drug up on stage and had fried chicken rubbed on my belly. And they throw fried chicken out into the crowd. That is their stick. But you either love them or, you, I mean, you either hate them 
or you rabidly love them. There is no in between with these guys. And that's kind of, I mean, I see the same thing with like old 97s. You either hate them or you're going to love them and, and, and respect them. And that kind of, that brings up another point. Southern culture and on the skids, correct? Yeah. yeah. I just looked them up. It says on, on Spotify alone, they've got about 60,000 monthly listeners. Uh huh. And I have never in my life until right now heard of them. You're going to love found, them. They found, I don't know, roughly 100,000 people, which isn't a big number in the grand scheme. Well, there's 8 billion people on earth. Yeah. But, that's enough people to keep you doing your thing for as long as you want to do it. And that's badass. Absolutely. And those, those bands are everywhere. That's one reason I love, I love your podcast because you're never going to run out of people for other people to discover like nope. quality people. Nope. And they're tucked away in little pockets all across this country. And cause I mean, you and I, we, you know, we found each other just, I mean, through you, you found me and, and heard the show, but you know, there's, and you're down in Texas, you know, I'm just, there's guys all over Texas right now that I'm kind of talking back and forth with about bringing on, but there's also guys I've got in Illinois and Oklahoma and Oregon. And, you know, there's even guys doing damn fine, you know, outlaw honky tonk out of Detroit. You know, I don't think you can really, you can't define. That's why I just, I call it what, what we know and love. I know you, it's branded as Americana, but really it's just American music. And American music is, is it can come from anywhere because it's about people that still, you know, know what it is to work hard to make a dollar for the day and to come home dirty and to love their family, know how to, you know, wind down with some good music, you know, imbibing their, their favorite beverage of choice, or, you know, being, uh, what I lovingly refer to, uh, several friends of mine is herbally enhanced. <laughs> <laughs> Very common in the genre. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, and just to go back to one other thing, I know you're talking about, I know I'm, I'm changing subjects but you were talking about the depression and everything. You know, I don't think there's a, out of, out of all my local buddies that, that play and that I'm out supporting all the time, there might be two that are actually happy with, that are happy on stage and are happy with how they write their music. And people love them for that. And they're known for that. And they put on... They put on the most vibrant, you know, raucous shows you're going to go to. And, you know, I support the hell out of those guys. But it's these other guys. It's the ones that, you know, they're an artist based out of their own, trying to get out of their own heads because to fight through that depression and that angst and that hurt and sorrow or whatever, those are the guys that are writing some of the most beautiful stuff and the ones that really can move you. And I think you find that more common in music these days is you're not, you don't have to be happy. Your happiness is not derived from where, what you're not right. You're writing about your life and how you feel or something that you've been led to write about and you're not performing happy, but that's, What's making you happy? I know it sounds nuts, but that's kind of how I see it. Well, artists are nuts, and uh, you kind of you bring be. up, you gotta be, and you you bring up uh, the depression thing again, and I, you'll hear me. You you call it American music. You'll hear me call it alt country, not because I like, not because that's the right answer, but because I don't know what the hell else to call it. Right. You know, kind of like. The, off the beaten, off the highway, like I said, that's what I call alt country. Dirt and road the thing music. That, dirt road music. And the thing that really makes me think, uh, you know, how how do you determine what it is? I, I think it's kind of it is the depression. It is the grittiness. I've heard you use that word in a former podcast. Oh, yeah. It is the the blue collar aspect. The and uh, did you see the uh, the Ken Burns country music? 
Love extravaganza. It, it was the, <laughs> one of the best things I've ever watched. Well, I think it was Loretta Lynn that said something along the lines of if it's real stuff, it's country is what she said. And exactly. that kind of made perfect sense. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's I really do get depressed. I really do get in love and then fall out of liking the person I love. Like all this weird, complex stuff that we all that we normal people who work for a living and get sad and try to hang on and try to medicate yourself with whiskey every now and then and all this really complex shit that happens to people that's real stuff it's not it's not the you know trying to pick up a girl in the club i mean yeah that really happens but that's not your life and if that is no. what you do every it's, day of your life that ain't that's sad that ain't that's sadder than being depressed yeah <laughs> i mean and, and you know really that's not living if that's what that's how your uh life is being spent because you're you're kind of wasting away and just you're throwing yourself away on something frivolous. It's hollow. Yeah. No, and, and you know, going back to Ken Burns Country, I actually uh, put a tweet out there after I finished watching it, and uh, and I, and, I, and it was a really simple tweet. And I'm like, okay, we just finished watching, you know, the last episode of of Ken Burns Country. I said. If you can sit through that whole episode and your face not leak a little bit, you don't have a soul. Yeah, uh, dude, because these those country singers back in the day, uh, before it got really, really, which I guess it's been there's been different sects of country the oh, whole yeah. time. Like the you had you had Chet Atkins, who I love by the way, but he had like a formula. He had the Nashville sound mm -hmm. and. That that's still going on today. You know, the Nashville sound is hip hop beats, and let me get, let me pick you up and get you a drink, girl. That's the formula today. But real country music, it is it, it is going to make you feel something. It is going to make you cry, either happy tears or sad tears, or it's going to make mm -hmm. you really think about. Like Chris Christopherson, he'd make you think about stuff. You know? Oh God, yeah. And I mean, I've always loved Christopherson. I mean, talk about a hell of a songwriter, and he's another proof. You don't have to have the greatest voice in the world if you're telling a great story. Yeah, and you, I, I think about uh, man, I have a million examples. I can't think of any of them right now. But there's a lot of people that their songwriting is so good and their voice is not good. But over time, when people keep hearing these great songs, they begin liking the voice. Here, exactly. I'll, I just thought of somebody, Robert Earl Cain. That's not the best voice in the world. But when I hear it start up on a song, I'm so it. excited to hear the song. I'm like, yeah, I love Robert O'Keefe's voice. <laughs> Whether it's good or not, I love it and I want more of it. Yeah, and I mean, and Robert O'Keefe's a classic. I mean, well, and even if you want to go back to the whole rock genre of things, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Um, of course, I'm going to draw, completely draw a blank at this point in life. Um, um We'll come back to it. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of guys that they, you know, you wouldn't think that that's the greatest voice I've ever heard. But like you said, the more people hear it, but then I also think that opens up people. It opens their ears and their minds up to give other people a chance that they may not have before because they're like, you know, their voice is, is, is so, so. But then it's it's more of let me listen to their lyrics and let me listen to their you know how they are as a musician when they're composing the music for that you know when that comes out that can completely win you over because I mean there's those are, go ahead those are gateway artists man you know like gateway drugs yeah you, you take one drug you like a, a a soft core drug and you're like I guess I'll, I'll try this one I heard this one was good too and all of a sudden you're a crackhead <laughs> there's gateway artists that are like i mean their voice ain't great but you really get into them and then there's these other artists that also you had hang-ups about you're thinking like you just said you know what let me i really will let me listen to this guy like you start listening to people differently you start listening paying more attention to the lyrics they're, they're those are gateway artists they yeah. they get you off the shininess of a voice and a sound and get you into the lyrics and then they open it up for for other artists similar to them well, it's, it's all about the storytelling aspect of things because 
you can write a million songs and never truly tell a story, but then like your music, I mean, you tell great stories with your lyrics and that's a skill that, you know, you either have it or you don't, I think. I don't think that's a, that's a, I mean, I guess you could, you, you can learn and, and, and develop that over a lot of time, but some people you can just tell that that comes a little more natural to than it does others. Um, you know, uh, they're like, well, I mean, going back to uh, Turnpike Troubadours, Evan wrote some of the most great stories, you know, the, and he tells a story. And on one album, there are bits and pieces of that story that gets told throughout because there's always a reference back, like his grandfather's Browning shotgun. You know, that's that's a one that keeps going through, but it's those stories that makes everything so identifiable. Like with Puzzle Man. Puzzle Man, you hear that song and you're like, you know what? I completely identify with this. This is not a, uh, you know, it's not a fluke. What were your influences? Uh, well, like I said, specifically, I didn't. I didn't have specific influences when I was when I was doing the album, and it was really weird doing this album because I had some songs picked out that I thought I might want to record, and then I recorded two of them. The first two I recorded were Puzzle Man and Mishandled Heart. I recorded those two, and uh, then I went back. To you know, uh, we did that in a day, and then we scheduled another session like a week later. And I had these songs I'd planned to do, but I had been listening to Puzzle Man and Mishandled Heart, you know, the demos, mm -hmm. and uh, that kind of inspired me to write more. So there were there were a couple of songs I wrote during the making of the album. Like I sat down and like a Dream Girl, I wrote that. I was getting out at the gym one day, and me and my wife went to the gym, and I said, "Go on ahead." She was like, what? I said, just go. And I sat in the car and I was on my phone, the little note app, you uh -huh. know, you got these little, and I started typing these lyrics and then I got the voice recorder out and recorded a line just to preserve the melody. And while I was lifting weights, I was thinking the whole time about this damn song. And then when I got home, she went in her room and I quietly started working out the song. And about 30 minutes later, I had it. And like that, that was a result of listening to my own recordings from that session. So the album influenced the album itself, the direction that started going influenced new songs. So, I mean, oddly enough, the songs that I, the songs that I began recording started influencing the rest of the album. It also influenced the ones I picked that were already written. You know what I mean? So I really played it by ear. Yeah. And, uh, mishandled heart is actually, you know, of us doing that transition, this is going to be the next song people are going to hear and get to listen to because, you know, that song, I mean, that's a classic country song if there ever was. another one that kind of just stuck with me and that's why I, you know i selected it to go in this episode not that the other stuff's not great but those were the first two that really really moved me 
And I'm like, okay, this, these are the two that we've got to feature. Well, one puzzle man is the title track. So, but well, you know, that's kind of, it's funny you say that those are two of my favorites too. And that's why I wanted, I said, I told the, the mastering guy, he said, Hey man, can I kind of put a, can I put them in order for you and see what you think? And I said, absolutely. You know, I'd, I've tried putting song my own songs in order on previous albums, and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And uh, he put, I said, I just I want Puzzle Man first, and he was like, I agree, I agree. And then he put the order out there, and I think Mishandled Heart was like number five. I said, man, let's put that one at two because those are my two of my favorite, and I want people to make sure they hear those. But then there was a. I was concerned about the back end of the album because a lot of people, they'll start listening and kind of peter out, even Mm -hmm. if they like it. They'll listen to four of them and then they'll go into work and then they'll never bring it back up again, you know, if they, if, if they're not big fans of you or something. And I kind of wish, uh, the song never learn it's later in the album, like number nine or something. That's a good one. I love that one. And I think, I think that's as far as telling stories, that's one hell of a story. And it's, it's, real shit and it's real heavy and deep and i feel like a lot of people haven't heard that one and i'm like damn i should i put that one number three or number four you know but at the same time you also don't want to front load the album with all your favorites you want it to you kind of want to spread them out throughout well you know then that song may be the uh our outro song for this uh interview then that way everybody gets a little bit of taste of the whole thing and uh from you know beginning to end which, you know, also tells a story in and of itself. Well, Seth, who were your influences growing up? I mean, how did you, what made you decide, hey, I'm going to go down this path and I'm going to be a singer and songwriter? Oh, man, this could be a podcast by itself. But uh, I, uh, I go into these, I'm really weird in a lot of ways, actually, but I'm really weird in the, the fact that I'm real regimented, uh, it, it's funny. We were, I'm a PTA and we were in PTA school and my carpool buddy, we we're going over, uh, autism because, you know, you have to work with autistic patients, sometimes yeah. patients with autism. And they're talking about the spectrum of aut- autism and, and they're like, and some people, they have a low case of it and they're really very routine oriented, regimented and do the same things every day. And my buddy, his eyes got real big and he looked at me and I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> because I may I'm be exactly high functioning. Like, I might be on the, uh, on the, uh, the scale there, but, uh, that's how I am. And I'm kind of like that with music too. I'll get into a band and I will destroy their catalog for months. Like I will just be on that sucker and I will not budge from it. Now I'm not like that as much today these days because I'm trying to I'm trying to listen to a lot of different people. But uh, in high school, man, I listened to Sublime. That was one, one of the few bands I listened to for like two years. I was just infatuated with their carefree attitudes, their punk, the fact that they'll break out a freaking freestyle on a track, rapping. And I was like, dude, these guys. They don't care. Like it was a punk attitude. We don't care. We don't mm-hmm. care if, if you like it. We don't care if you were if you if you wanted to hear twelve punk tracks. We're gonna rap on number nine. Screw you. That's kind of how they were. Of course, them. They, it was all born out of being effed up, you know, drunk and on drugs. But yeah. you know, whatever. But uh, then I got into uh, the red dirt thing. Started happening. People were tell. People told me. My cousin told me about Pat Green when I was like thirteen, and I didn't know who it was and didn't care. But he was like, you have to listen to him. I never did. I eventually did, but, I, you know. And then you were like, damn it, why didn't I listen when I was yeah, told I was like, to? I should listen to my cousin, man. My cousin knew who he was talking about. But then I started getting into uh, ragweed, cross-Canadian ragweed. Love and guys. I loved, I loved, uh, that's another vibe. You know, Sublime, I loved their vibe. I loved ragweed's vibe. There was another one of those, you know, man, we'll do whatever. We'll do country. We'll do rock. We'll do a two-minute solo. I got into that, and then I got into the old 97s. And I started writing songs when I was 16, and I honestly think that kind of retarded my development a little bit because I was writing all sorts of genres, and I couldn't settle down and just kind of work on a craft of writing a specific type of song. And I didn't start settling down and writing specific types till I was about 26. I'm 33 now. But on the back end of all that, I think it ultimately helped because it really diversified what I can do, and it kind of expanded my bag of tricks you know, I can, I can, I've been through it. I can get over a writer's block real easy because I've, 
I've been through this stuff. And if you want to grow as a writer, and I don't know how you could force this, but it just happened to me, like write kind of indie sounding stuff that doesn't have a genre tied to it. Like real, like people can't pick it out yep. because if you can make that sound good, now you jump into punk or you jump into country and that's kind of like, it's real easy. It's like child's play. It's like, man, if I could make that other crap work, I can make this work. <laughs> so it's, uh, it was a long journey and I was inspired by sublime old 97s cross Canadian ragweed, Mike McClure, Bayside, all sorts of bands, man. And, but it's always come back to me. It's always come back to the, uh, the grittiness, the blue collar, that kind of, I don't know, man, the old 97s. When I, if I had to explain old 97s to somebody, I would say gritty. Yeah. And that's what I really like about it. And real. Gritty and real. Yep. Cause I mean, it's so identifiable by everybody that listens to them. So, uh, <clears throat> what was your uh, first guitar? Oh, my first or guitar. What, what was the first instrument you learned? Or okay, that's a that's a good that's a good topic right there too. I come from a musical family. <clears throat> my grandpa, who is a lifelong pastor, pastor and landlord, he landlords so, he landlorded so that he didn't have to take money from the church. Okay, so he never took from the church, and uh, he was. He actually made a gospel album when he was in the 70s, uh, early 70s, and he played like 12 instruments on there. Guitar, wow. mandolin, harmonica, drums, organ, piano. I mean, good Lord, I forgot all everything he played, but he was a great musician. My grandma plays the organ and the piano like it's nothing. My mom is a great singer. She sounds like Whitney Houston. My dad plays guitar, bass, drums. My brother used to reel off. Red Hot Chili Pepper solos like it was nothing. Uh, my brother, me, and my dad are all drummers. Okay. And and it's funny. I never really practiced. I just sat down at my dr- my dad's drum kit and started making a beat. And it was like, oh, well, you're just a person who drums. That's all I was. So for a long time in my high school bands, I would drum and sing like Don Henley yep. because nobody else wanted to sing. They're like, oh. Oh, my throat hurts. I think they were just nervous. Or I was like, I got stage fright. Yeah. Well, that's what they didn't, they didn't want to say it, but that's what was happening. So I, I, was, I was like, I'll do it. So I used to drum and sing and, and I always loved writing songs. That was always been my favorite part of music is writing songs. But when you are only a drummer, that's hard as hell. Yeah. And I would tell my guitar player like, Hey, play that other sound again. And he'd play it. I'd be like, no, no, no. The one before that. And I'm like, yeah, start with that. And that, although we did come up with some good songs, that is not a sustainable way of writing songs. So I I started picking at the guitar a little bit. I was terrible at it, of course. And uh, then I quit for a while, which, by the way, that is a very common theme for people. I played it, the the pick fell in the hole and my fingers hurt, and I quit. (laughs) That's what happens to people. But anyway, I picked it back up, and uh, oddly enough, I didn't really start. I didn't really turn a corner until I started playing Guitar Hero at a buddy's house, and I, w- I went from terrible at Guitar Hero to really good. And I thought, what the hell am I playing Guitar Hero for when I, I exactly. could play a real guitar? A real <laughs> so I picked up a real guitar, and it really it gave me confidence. I'm like, okay, I, all you gotta do is practice. I practiced that damn game and got good. I'll practice the damn guitar and get good. And I started playing real easy. Red Dirt songs like uh, the first two songs I learned, Boys from Oklahoma by Ragweed yeah. and uh, Crazy Eddie by Reckless Kelly. And after I played those two songs, I'm like, I thought to myself, OK, I can I can play the guitar. I can play real songs. So I started covering a couple of things very quickly, stopped covering stuff and started writing my own shitty songs. And uh, from that point on, I'm, I'm primarily a um, I don't even want to call myself a guitar player because I'm not that damn good. But. <laughs> That's the instrument I play. I'm I'm a songwriter. That's what I am. I'm a songwriter. And see, that's that's kind of how when people have always asked, you know, you know, what were you doing when I'm like, I've always been a singer. I play at guitar, but I'm more of a singer, and that's just what I've always done. I mean, I I can play, I can I can hold my own playing a bass, but it's I'm more comfortable. I mean, I can sit there holding a guitar pick a little rhythm with it 
<laughs> um, I mean, I've done it, but you know, it's, it's still, you know, you just use that as a crutch, I guess, to help you, uh, you know, get through, <laughs> you know, that one song, especially when you're first learning and you're trying to deal with those fears of getting up and singing in front of a group of people. Because I mean, I'll never forget the first time I got up in front of 500 people to sing at a church and you're just like, you know, you're like, wow, this is so many people. But then you don't think anything about it, you know, years later when there's 1,500 people there and you're like, oh, okay, whatever. It's even, you think about it even less. But, and I know you as an artist, you know, tell me, I talked to so many different people across so many different genres and everything as well because, you know, like I said, I will talk music with anybody. But it's what... Do you change your what your performance is, whether it's fifteen people or fifteen thousand people? You know, do you do you give that same effort and show into each every each and every one? Well, I have probably played total a hundred shows in my life. So I don't have a huge uh, catalog to study here, but mm-hmm. I have played. I have played for a handful of people, and I've paid, played for a couple hundred people. Um, and in both cases, I do not. I do not get nervous. The only thing that has ever made me nervous is if I'm completely unprepared and don't know the answer to a question, or you know, if I if I'm unprepared essentially. Yeah. And if I'm up there playing my songs that I know. I'm prepared. I'm not worried about it. It could be, it could be, uh, I could be playing, you know, I could be playing in a, a back backstage in a room with Robert O'Keefe staring at me and I'd be fine. I could be playing for 80,000 people in AT&T stadium and I'd be fine because I'm, to me, it's always been like a, Hey, this, these are my songs and this is my show. If they don't like it, they can walk out exactly. <laughs> and, and they did come here for a reason. So let me, let me just be me and do this. And guess what? And, you got a microphone and they don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I've always thought about it like that. Like, uh, whenever I was, whenever I do presentations, like in school or like an in service at a job or something, or if there's one that needs to be done, people are like, let Seth do it because they know I don't care. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to. I'm going to, you know, I'm not nervous. I'm going to make, make a joke. I'm going to talk about the product. I'm going to answer any questions that come at me. I'm not worried about it. I've never been worried about being in front of people. And which again, really weird that I'm an introvert, but that's just, you know, like I said, I'm an introvert because I like being alone. I don't have to be, I'm, I can do anything in front of a crowd, but I am curious. I'm very curious and, you know, God willing, I'll get the chance someday how it would be if I had a full band that I had chemistry with and had been playing with for a while and was playing a big show like Billy Bob's Texas or Red Rocks Amphitheater or something like that. Like in Maroon I, Hall I, I think or that, the Caverns I don't in think Tennessee. Would, yeah, yeah, those big, those big venues with a lot of people showing up because I, I do know that you feed off of a crowd. Mm-hmm. And, and, I would like to see how basically how fun it could get with a band that you're comfortable with in front of a big high energy crowd that's singing along to the songs. And I, and I can't wait for that day because that to me, that's uh, like I said, I love songwriting. My main thing is songwriting. That's what I enjoy doing, but I do think it sounds really fun to go on a stage where people are chanting your name and then that you come out and sing a song and they're singing it too. I've never experienced that. And I do think that would be a, I do think that would, that would change the way you perform. I don't think you could help it. Oh, absolutely. You need to, uh, to, uh, there's so many good festivals out and about. You need to throw your name in the ring. <clears throat> Get that opportunity, man. Yeah, that's, I agree. There's, there's, there's artists that, they they're not really well known but they get on those festival circuits they're like oh yeah i'll play the i'll play the 3 p.m gig for a festival that goes till midnight yeah i'll do it and uh they get one they get that that experience of being on a big stage with 
with you know a bigger crowd and two they 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 acquire new fans because people that don't give a damn about you are going to that festival and they see you they see you on the poster they see you on the stage they might buy your shirt because it looked cool and then three when you're putting together a resume uh for bar owners or for for gigs you can say hey here's the list of people i've played with and you can put that damn poster on there. <laughs> like yep. I, was, I opened for these guys, you know? Yeah. And there's nothing like, you know, having a poster that shows, Hey, I opened up for, uh, you know, all the Braun brothers. I opened up for reckless and I opened up for Mickey in the motor car, you know, Hey, check this out. Or I opened up for Shane Smith and the saints. Instant legitimacy. When <laughs> you can put that on an email. Yeah. Oh, pfft. Heck yeah. Well, I mean, even when you're trying to market a podcast, it doesn't hurt either that, you know, you've got, you've had some bigger names on and that, you know, they, you know, have nothing but good to say about the experience and everything too. And, uh, actually, you know, here a little bit later in the spring, I've got Shane Smith coming on. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to that opportunity to sit down and talk. I heard, I heard that. I saw that, uh, you said on one of your episodes and uh, I was thinking, Dan, that'll, I mean, I, that's, I'm guessing that'll be the most known guy you've had on there. Shane Smith is huge in Texas. So, well, I mean, in Dallas Moore, he's gotten really big. Um, he does outlaw. He does a lot with Billy Don Burns, who is a staple of, uh, you know, in the outlaw world, um, been around for ages and ages. So, I mean, there's, and it's just those opportunities. I mean, hell, I invited, I sent an invite to Jason Isbell. I was like, hey, you know, I'd love to you to come on and talk about your new album on my show. I said, we may be small, but we're mighty. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's just, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You, you do an invite, you ask somebody, what's the worst going to happen? They're going to say no. Right. But, like, I mean, if you kept sending those invites to bigger, you know, Isbell and Childers and Sturgill Simpson, you know, the guys that are really big right now, uh, more than likely you'll get ignored and nothing happened. You didn't, you didn't get fined. Nope. You didn't get, they didn't say anything bad about you. Like, Oh, this guy invited me. What a loser. Nothing happened. They ignored you. Yeah. Like who cares? So you should definitely fire all the shots. It's you their can loss. Because it's the, yeah, it's their loss anyway, by the way. But, uh, I mean, if you get ignored by 20 big acts and then one is like, oh, yeah, man, that sounds cool. I got some time Tuesday. Bam, you hit. Yeah. You hit. <laughs> well, <do> it. <laughs> and, and it doesn't hurt that because of some of the relationships I've built over the years that, you know, we have, I have, we, that artist and I might have a mutual friend that's like, hey, why don't you get my buddy, just help him out a little bit and come on the show. I never heard seen anything. <laughs> no, you not know, at all. Sometimes that's how of, you get another big act is yeah. because of the connection. But, you know, regardless, I don't care how many big acts I get on. It's, it's still more, that adds legitimacy, but it, this show is always going to be about those guys that are still out there just plugging away day in and day out that nobody hasn't had, nobody's had the chance to get to hear them and to introduce them to a bigger audience which, you know, is why, you know, when, when you and I first started talking about this, I'm like, absolutely. I believe in, in your music and I want to get it out there to everybody that'll listen. But, uh, before we go into the bare bones of things, which, you know, you've listened to my show, you know how this goes. Hopefully you oh, didn't yeah. do too much homework on that. Um, <laughs> with the fact that you like, like old 97s and that rock and roll that's got that, feel and vibe and alt country you need to go check out brass tax brass tax the brass tax brass, the, just plain old brass too. tax they're out of uh oregon they've got a new single coming out on the 31st and a new album coming out in february and these guys you can find some find one of their latest songs on youtube it's called out yonder check it out these these guys are something else um, keep the devil chained. Yeah. I like it already. <laughs> yeah. These guys are so good. Um, and one of the best group of guys you could hang out, you could talk to, um, their guitarists and I've become 
great, great friends. I actually, I consider him family. So I always have to give him a plug when I get an opportunity. We'll be listening to them and the, the, the other band you told me about. Uh, I Southern Culture on the Skids. Yeah. Southern Culture. Yeah. You have to, uh, you have to, you know, text me and let me know what you think. I'll let you know. All right. Well, we're going to jump in then. What is your favorite guitar to play? My favorite guitar to play is a, uh, it's a real simple answer. It's my Takamini. It's an S series <clears throat> and it's the, it's the, I've, I've, I bought like cheap ass guitars in high school. I don't even remember what they were. Um, and I've been given some guitars. Like I said, I'm from a musical family. My grandpa gave me a, a nice Fender. He gave me a badass Martin. It's got a crack in it, but it is badass. It looks awesome. Uh, dark wood grain. Uh, but my Takamini, that's the first guitar, acoustic electric guitar I bought. And uh, I kind of, I kind of, I don't know. When I bought that guitar, I started writing a lot more and I kind of turned a corner on it. So it's, it's not like, it's not the best guitar I've ever felt. You know, it's, it has a great sound. It feels good, but it's more of a, like that, that guitar went through the bullshit with me. Right. <laughs> so it's more yeah, of an emotional thing, it's, I guess. It's, it's kind of like an appendage at this point. It's exactly. just like, I still pick and I, an, I pick a uh, Oscar Smith, I, I love that guitar. It's got a good sound to it. Now, would I, you know, would I put that down for one of those, you know, good high quality tailors, upper end tailors? Absolutely. But uh, until somebody wants to sponsor that, I'm going to pick the hell out of this one. Oh, yeah. And the, I guarantee you, Willie could find a better guitar than Trigger, but he ain't going to. He's going exactly. to keep playing Trigger till he dies. It's exactly. an emotional attachment. That's his thing. Yep. Okay. What band are you really into right now? Right now, I'm going to, I'm, like I said, I've been spreading out what I listen to a lot. Uh, I, I did listen to Dallas Moore for like two days straight because despite the fact that he's been grinding his ass off for what, over like a decade, two decades, something two, like over that. Over two decades now. I, I discovered him like four days ago. So, I mean, talk about, you know, thank you God for this gift that fell out of the sky. You know, you when you discover an artist that's badass, that's been, yep. that has a catalog of 10 something albums. That's, that's awesome. So I've been into him and, uh, just a lot of Cody Jinx because mm -hmm. I've only known about Cody Jinx for about three years, which, I mean, that's a long time, but he was at it way before that too. Oh yeah. And, um, I've been into Cody Jinx a lot. Um, which Cody Jenks, I, not only do I love his music, but I really like his, the fact that he's fiercely independent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he actually signed with a label one year and then dropped him. <laughs> he's like, no, I, I like doing things my way. I don't want anyone to tell me anything that I need to do outside of my small circle, you know, which I don't know, man. I'm weird too about, I really, I really do. You know, there's people that say, I don't care if the guy's an asshole. I'm going to listen to his music. I'm sort of the opposite. I am if too. I, if I, <clears throat> if I hear a dude's like, if everyone says this guy is a huge asshole, you know, and I'll, like, I might stop listening to him. And on the other side, if I, if, if I really respect what a guy's doing and how he does it and how he is, I'm going to give him, I'm going to listen to him more and appreciate it more, you know, assuming there's something there, obviously I'm not going to. I can hear someone's the best guy in the world, and if he sucks, I can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> but or if but, you find out that they have horrible fans, that's oh yeah, that's that's the worst. When you go to, and I've got tickets for an upcoming show. I'm not going to say who it is, but uh, you know, here lately there's been catching grief for how horrible their fan base is right now. I mean, and I'm a fan, but apparently their their fans at shows are just they act horribly and i just um I'm, I'm that's the one thing i'm nervous about about this show i know the artists themselves are going to be amazing but the fans that are there kind of makes me kind of question that a little bit well I, I know what you're talking about and i won't mention the name either but yeah. one time we went to lone star park and we, we wanted to go see reckless kelly they were opening for the headliner and we didn't care about the headliner, but the headliner's fans 
were there in full force. And this was a uh, a college party type crowd. Mm-hmm. And man, I've always been an old soul. I like for everyone to you know sip on some whiskey and just have fun and yep. and enjoy it and listen to the lyrics and stuff. And not that I'm against partying, but but th- these people, they're like. I'm talking about girls on on guys' shoulders throwing up off the shoulder, and then the guy falling down, and like people dropping beer on the floor, and it was just it was terrible, and it yeah. it ruined the entire experience. But that's that dude's fan base, yeah. so I'm like, man, that would really suck for your fans to just be a bunch of drunk jackasses, you know? Yeah, you got a room full of douchebags. That's exactly <laughs> what happened. Okay, moving on. Next question. Um, what is your all-time favorite book? All-time favorite book. I used to be a huge reader, and I don't read as much anymore, although I just bought uh, the first of the Lonesome Dove books. I'm really looking forward to that. That's, right. obviously, that's obviously one of the greatest books ever read, if you hear anyone tell it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm excited about that, but I haven't read it, so I'm not going to pick that one. Uh I used to read a lot of fantasy. I don't do that anymore. I read the first musical biography type book I read was an autobiography called Waylon about Waylon Jennings, written by Waylon Jennings. And man, I enjoyed that so damn much. That might be my favorite book ever. I enjoyed it so much because obviously I liked learning about Waylon, but you want to put yourself – you want to put yourself in these situations while Waylon's talking about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a different time. I mean, it's freaking Waylon Jennings. Yeah. And uh, he's telling these stories about these shows that got crazy. And when he was backstage, you know, he, he got shot at and just all this crazy stuff. And one, you're learning about one of your, uh, your heroes. You're learning about a musical, uh, an American icon, but, you're also being inspired at the same time. And I've read, I've read most of Johnny Cash's book. It's like 8 million pages. And I've read, uh, two Willie autobiographies. And th- th- when I read that stuff, it's not just entertaining and informative, but it's, it's very inspiring. I mean, one, I, one of the things Willie said was he was like 45 years old and, he was like struggling to pay the bills. Like he hadn't, he had, he was known, he was a, a big songwriter, but he, he didn't have a lot of money. And I'm thinking, man, I've been, I've been so down before, like when I was 30, thinking that this is never going to happen. Willie freaking Nelson hadn't really made it at 45. So if, I mean, if that doesn't inspire you to keep going, I don't know what will. Willie Nelson was a decade down the line from where you are when he hit big. Yeah. So that was cool. But anyway, the answer I'd say is probably Waylon. Okay. Now, as a Texas man, I kind of I, I got a feeling I know where you, how you're going to go with this one: pulled pork or brisket, dry rub, or sauce. But if it's going to be sauce, what kind of sauce? Uh, that is actually very easy. I'm going to go with brisket. I knew that was going to be the answer. You don't not, ask not a Texas just, man if it's going to be brisket or pulled pork. Oh yeah, not just because. <laughs> It's brisket, and brisket's badass, but I've never been a huge pulled pork fan anyway. To me, that's more of a put it on some good buns and put some barbecue sauce on it. I don't want to just eat pulled pork straight up. Uh, But barbecue sauce or dry rub, honestly, if you cook the brisket perfectly, you don't even want barbecue sauce on it because the the flavor is there. And uh, if you season it properly, and like I said, cook it properly, it will have what we like to call bark on it. Mm-hmm. And that bark, those burnt ends. That, that oh, I love burnt ends. That's my favorite that thing. Black, that black business on the side. Yeah. And uh, there's a place in Tyler, Texas called Stanley's Barbecue. It's regularly a top 50 place in Texas. Uh, if you go there and ask for extra bark brisket, they'll give it to you. And you'll put it in your mouth, and you'll shove the sauce to the other side of the table because you don't need it. You want you want to taste that that bark. And but if I had to do barbecue sauce, I think I would do the typical Texas, a little bit of tang and some heat. That's what okay. I like. I like heat in the barbecue sauce. All right, I feel you there. Yeah, I don't know what it is about Carolina barbecue. You any place you go, you ask, "Hey, do you guys have burn ends?" And they just look at you like you got three heads. And I'm like. I cannot believe you people don't get what one of the best parts of barbecue is. 
I'd be so of, disappointed. Outside of a big old rack of ribs, like good old beef ribs too, like those dinosaur ribs. That's oh, about yeah. the only thing that's going to step up a little bit level higher. Mm-hmm. All right. What was the first record you ever bought for yourself and or picked out and for somebody to buy for you specifically? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I probably honestly don't remember. Like I was probably, my parents probably got me one as a kid. I remember my dad got me a, a, a Kansas album because my, my mom and dad love Kansas and uh, it's that was a little, overture. It might have been. I don't remember. And then he got me a Boston album, had like a rocket ship on the cover. But that music was like over my head. Like it was real, <clears throat> real. I mean, they're obviously like the, some of the best musicians of all freaking time. Uh, it's like classic music in rock form. Yeah. So that music was like over my head. I didn't get it at that. I was a little kid. I was wanting like a fun beat and crap like that. But uh, the first one I picked out myself was actually, believe it or not, a burnt CD. That's <laughs> I grew up in. I grew up in that era. Yeah. Um, it was Blink One Eighty Two, Enema of the State. Okay. And I downloaded. I downloaded the album, and then I liked it so much, I actually bought it, even though I already owned it. You know, it it may or may not have had something to do with the cover of the album, which was a very busty nurse putting on a, a glove and holding an enema. Yeah. But uh. It probably had a lot to do with that when I bought it, but I loved it so much, man. I started, I, I bought Enema of the State, and then I bought their older album, Dude Ranch, and I, that's when I really started getting into punk music. So I think, I think the first one I picked out myself was Enema of the State. Okay, what was the first concert you remember going to? <laughs> the first concert I remember going to <laughs> was, you know, that Christian band DC Talk. I absolutely do. It, I went to a DC Talk concert when I was like six or something. It was at Six Flags Over Texas. They had this amphitheater, and DC man, DC Talk sold that sucker out. There are a lot of people there, but I was like hungry and sleepy and hot, and, and I was crying. <laughs> I was crying the whole time, and I remember standing under the bleachers where no one else was there, and thinking, "I just want to stay here until it's over." And I'm sure my parents knew I was there because they didn't mess with me but i just stood there for like an hour waiting for the concert to be done trying not to cry so yeah that was my first concert experience <laughs> wow and it was a bad I one that concert. <laughs> i mean i've seen them i've seen them back in the day um so star wars or star trek hmm i've heard you ask this one before and uh I try not to think too much about it, but I did think about it. And if it's between those two, I'd pick Star Wars because I have very little experience with Star Trek. I I haven't seen much Star Trek. But I'll tell you what, the best sci-fi story I've ever seen is actually a video game called Mass Effect. Yeah, Mass Effect. It's got like the greatest story, sci-fi story, the the attention to detail, the twists, the turns, the personalities – Man, you can – I wish they would turn that into a movie because, you know, most people aren't going to play a video game just for a story. But, man, that's the best. That's the most – you could probably find a, a a YouTube video. You know how people, like, make a video of all, just the, story, all the, uh, the story lines. Yeah, you could probably find that on there. But, man, that was – I wish you could get more credit. But if it's between Star Wars and Star Trek, I'm afraid I've never given Star Trek a proper chance. So I'd have to go with Star Wars. All right. Good call anyway. Can't go wrong with that. Yeah. One. All right. I'm going to hit you with another one. What is your jam song? And then also, what is your guilty pleasure song? My jam song. Uh, that one that you, the volume's going up and the windows are coming down and your foot's going down on the pedal. That, you know, you're just, you're getting into it. That's just, it gets you going. <clears throat> uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the band. My Chemical Romance. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the greatest albums of all time, The Black Parade. The first two tracks are obviously two different songs, but they fade, the first one fades right into the next one. I believe the first song is called Dead. The second song, I forgot. But the, the first two tracks are, I'll consider those one song. And that song, that, that song right there just, uh, Man, I 
you talk about drumming on the steering wheel and singing real l- louder than your voice can handle and your voice breaking up and shit like that. That that's probably my favorite. Check that one out, by the way. And do not, do not have your pl- your music device on shuffle. Because there's nothing more disappointing than when that first song it's it starts building up and he's like yelling and the guitar's going bang 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 and then the next track's supposed to kick in and that's when you start biting your lip and jamming but then it it shuffles to a different song and you're like why God did that just happen to me man so make I, sure your shuffle <clears throat> I don't that that never gets turned on I want to hear I want to hear how the artist and that sound engineer wanted that that the progress to be heard. Yeah, That's, as an album, I'm old school. Yeah. I'm old school like that because I'm old. I mean, let's make call a spade a spade. Well, let me let me uh let me branch off of that real quick. You you talked about the reverence of an album. That's really what you're talking about. Oh yeah. There there's there's a trend nowadays where I've I've you know I listen to music business podcasts and stuff and. People are these business guys are saying stuff like, well, you know, these days just release a single. It's just as effective. People don't buy albums. Release a little, uh, you know, a four track LP. Well, man, I think people want the album. They want to hear what you have planned. They want the cohesive, like, how does the album flow? Do these songs, I, they want to grade the album. Like, I love this album. They want to say, I love this album. Like people want that, and I think it's important to keep having albums as one piece of work. I agree with you there, <clears throat> but uh, I've also got a. a he's been a guest on the show, and he's become a a, a friend as well. Um, Jackson Taylor. He's got a different mindset. He's got the uh, mindset that you release that new single, and I mean you have that new album, but you release all the new songs two weeks apart and then you release the final version that's got everything. But he goes, the way you do that, he goes, that way you're getting everybody to actually make and take the time to listen to each one of those songs. And before they get tired of the whole album and just, you know, it gets tossed aside or, you know, deleted off of the playlist which, if you think about it from that aspect, the, I mean, it's kind of right. I mean, well, I still is. I still want to hear a whole album. And, you know, you're eventually going to hear a whole album. But this gives you the opportunity to truly sit down and listen and dissect. Now, I'm not saying only kick out one-offs and that's all you do. But if you've got an album, but you're just releasing, you know, the trickle individual, them out. trickle them out. So people have the opportunity to dissect and listen to all of them because I mean, everybody gets where they, you know, they're going to listen to their favorite couple. The list, they might listen through or do that quick scan through and see what's good, but they're not going to take the time to really listen to it. They're going to listen to the couple of ones they really want to listen to. And then they don't bother with the rest of it. Whereas if you're releasing them based off of, you know, Hey, you get this one for a couple of weeks to listen to. Then you get this one. And at the end you get the whole kit and caboodle and then you can listen to it from, you know, start to finish and truly digest it as an overall project. And he's, he's 100% correct, but that is from a business aspect. That's yeah. trying to get people to hear the songs. And that's what those, and once again, those guys that are business experts, that's what they would say too. So from a business aspect, that's 100% correct. For example, we, we talked about my song, Never Learn. It's buried. It's like track number nine. Uh, you know, if I'd have trickled these out one at a time, people could have heard that one. But I think immediately, we, as you release them from a business aspect, that makes what Jackson said makes perfect sense. But like five years down the line, that album needs to exist. You know, because like he said, trickle them out and then release a full album. That's actually best of both worlds. That's yeah. perfect because 10 years down the line, you know, people are going to forget about the trickle. They don't care about that. They got that album now. Yeah. So and they kind of taking care of it short term and long term. Yeah. And it's and it's well, and it's it's also building up for what's coming next. You know, you build up, build up that anticipation. <clears throat> and, you know, I don't know if you've listened to him a whole lot. But this guy just, he literally throws his whole heart and soul out on that stage when he gets on there. And, I mean, if you talk to him, his mind, he's hes he's got a million things going on at the same time. 
he he uh i i'm i know that i saw that he's i'm like a couple episodes away like i said i'm look, i'm listening to your stuff backwards yeah and i i saw him and i'm looking forward to it i actually i saw him man it was like 10 years ago a long time ago in longview texas it, it was a it was a three piece and someone said like his bass player didn't show up or something and he was playing bass uh-huh. and like he was I mean, I could just tell you he's a wild dude, and this is ten years ago, so imagine that. And uh, are you familiar with Mike McClure? No. Mike, Mike, write that down. Uh, I cannot stress this enough because he wrote all this red dirt stuff you hear. Uh, he wrote a lot of it that that you thought the artist wrote. Uh, a lot of ragweed songs he wrote. He recorded the Diamonds and Gasoline album from Turnpike. Really? He recorded he recorded most of Cross Canadian Ragweed's albums. Uh he's he's like a godfather of Red Dirt. Like okay. listen to the listen to the Everything Upside Down album. That was his first album after his band The Great Divide broke up. Uh look him up. But he told me about he told me about Jackson Brown um uh, or Jackson Jackson Taylor, Jackson Brown. He's good too I hear. Yeah. But uh <laughs> Jackson Taylor, he said, "Man, he's a he said he's a really intelligent guy, really oh, intelligent. Absolutely. Sometimes, sometimes can't get out of his own way. Uh-uh. But that's that's what happens when your when your brain is so active. You know, like I mean, I'm sure you've been like that before. I'm like that sometimes. Your your brain is just in every different direction. But he really got me. He got me real interested in Jackson Taylor because he 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 basically McClure is a space cadet. His mind is all over the place. He's super intelligent too, just a wild guy. And when he told me that. When he – out of his mouth, he said Jackson Taylor is really interesting and a, a smart guy, a funny, smart guy. I was like, damn, I need to get into Jackson Taylor. But I and was waiting until artist. after I hear – I was waiting until after I hear your episode with him. Okay. That way I can get to know him a little bit and yep. then start listening to his stuff. You need to do that because then you're going to get a deeper appreciation and understanding of his new stuff and mm-hmm. and how to – disseminate that and digest it because it will change your, it'll change your attitude about, um, it'll change how you listen. So I, I do recommend listening to the, uh, the show before you really start diving deep into the catalog. But, uh, I mean, he's a hell of a graphic artist too. He just released his first yes. graphic novel, um, first part of the month. So, I mean, and he's, and he's, his mind is always going and going and going and going. His wife is what keeps him sane and, and remembering to eat. <laughs> <laughs> he's just an artist, you know, and, and exactly. art, like, like uh, man, I draw all the time too. Like if you're just an, if you're more artist than the musician, you're going to create stuff. You have all to, over. you have to, that's what you do, you know? <laughs> okay. Who is a person living or dead that you'd like to take the stage with one time? I've actually, I've actually thought a bit about this a lot throughout my life. Cause that's, that's like an interesting scenario. And I'll, my, my first thought is always Waylon, but then I'll always talk myself out of it because man, he's a, he's an intimidating guy. Like he's aside from the fact that he's really good. His voice is phenomenal. Uh, he's also just a real, I mean, he even crossed. He he had, he was crossways with Willie a couple times, you know. And how do you get crossways with Willie? <laughs> you know, like, but Waylon, I don't know. Waylon's just a real intimidating dude. So I I think after I whenever I talk myself out of Waylon, I go to Cash because okay. I feel like me and Cash, me and Cash have a lot in common. I've I've read a lot about Cash. I've I watched a lot about Cash, and he he had a real conflicted mind too. And and just the he was when he wasn't on speed which was a lot when he wasn't on speed i feel like we had similar personalities too so i think i'd pick cash okay (laughs) what would be your life's mantra or you know say your own little personal saying to keep you going I've, i've been saying this for years the best slogan that's ever that i've ever heard is from nike just do it because, man, there's – the only way to achieve your goals in life is to just start doing it. Just start working towards it because the people that don't achieve their goals, the people that don't succeed, they're the people that give up. They're the people or that never say, tried. Or never tried the first – well, that's – yeah, that's the first time you give up is when you think about doing it and then you don't. 
But these people, they think, you know, like, oh, I wrote a song and I played it for people and they didn't care about it. Okay, well, write another one. Well, exactly. the first one, and they, and they think, well, the first one wasn't good. Well, just do it, just write it, and then, uh, you know, I'd like to play some some shows, but you know, I don't know, I don't really have a stage presence. No, just do it, man. Play play a shitty show, do a bad job ten times, and then the eleventh time you'll be better. Get I mean, up, just do an do open it, mic. Is, Why not? What's it going to hurt? You know, yeah, typically, I, who shows up for open mics? Other artists, and they're either going to they're either going to dig you or they're not, and. Yeah, I fully agree with it. Stop letting stop letting stop letting your your own insecurities hold you back from getting to where you want to be ultimately. And that's something I tell my kids all the time. Don't let you hold you back and get out and live your life. My parents would have probably told you that I was a maniac and had a death wish because I be, I'm a firm <laughs> believer <clears throat> if you're interested in something, I mean I tried rodeo and for a while. I mean, I was I, I worked, I did, uh, worked on a horse farm and breaking horses and everything. You know, I, I've actually walked around for a month with a horseshoe print around my eye from one that, um, <laughs> decided that he just didn't want to get work that day. But so then, that's what's wrong with you. Well, yeah, I think so. <laughs> but, uh, then my little blue healers jumped up, snatched him by the nose and flipped that big 1200 pound beast over and had him pinned Gosh. down. Like, I dare you to move. You hurt my daddy. <laughs> Man's <laughs> best friend. Exactly. I miss that dog every day. Mm. Okay. Besides yourself, who should people be checking out today? Music wise. Hmm. When I hear this question, I, I, I immediately think to find someone lesser known because no one needs me to say, you know, Turnpike or Cody Jinx because people already know about that. So let yeah. me think. Uh, if you wanted the 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 least known person that I can think of right now that I would suggest is actually a buddy of mine, but I would suggest him anyway. His name is Mondo Solace. M A N D O. He might go by Armando on on Spotify and stuff, but Mondo Solace, he he sounds a lot like Lucero. He's got a lot of that really? type of sound. <clears throat> yeah, and, you know, and you're not the first to, person to bring him up. I've got really, I've, yeah, I've got a uh, an earlier guest that um, Steve Idlet that yeah Steve Steve that, Idlet yeah. Yeah, they cuz they both play they're both from the same area, so they probably know of each other. Yeah, he he uh turned me on to him. That's that's really awesome. And see Yeah, so M Mondo's Mondo's badass, dude. He's really underrated and he he's smart and I he's he's actually played he's he's played live on the radio at some some thing in in Lindale before. So he he has like a little bit of steam, but he deserves a lot more. And uh another guy who's who's pretty well he's he's relatively well known in texas but i bet you most people in america have no idea who he is is a and i don't know how to pronounce his last name john bauman or bauman or bowman it's b-a-u-m-a-n-n -A -N, i think john bauman he's uh he's released like three or four albums he's a he's got a real unique style he's he's really good and has a unique style and uh, he's just a really good songwriter. And Jack Ingram gives him a thumbs up, which is a pretty good sign. Yeah, for sure. All right. So everybody's favorite question that we end the show with is, if you were an animal or you had a spirit animal, what would it be? Hmm. Spirit animal. Like someone want to identify with, right? Yeah. Well... My wife my uses first, people as spirit animals too, if that helps anything. She's like, You're my spirit animal. <laughs> well, you know, I my my initial thought is like a real logical one. I think of food chain and then I think humans are animals, but that's the stupidest answer ever. I'm not gonna pick human. <laughs> um uh, uh man. Part of me wants to pick Part of me wants to pick like a tiger because they are completely badass and they can beat the hell out of most anything they fight or at least escape it unscathed. Yeah. But there's another part of me that really wishes I was like a, a Galapagos Island turtle that no one messed with. I could just get in my shell and chill out and live. write songs. <laughs> and live for a couple of hundred years and be live left alone. 
just chilling out. Like, that, doesn't that sound like the dream vacation? Man, it really does. Not. <laughs> well, do you got any shout outs you want to throw at everybody, Seth? Oh man, uh, I I wish I had written a list because there's so many artists that that no one knows about that deserve to be heard. Uh, there's a there's another guy named Cheyenne Pitts. He's only got he's he's got like a I think six tracks online, but he's got a great voice. He's he's like a disciple of Joey Green, I think, who's also great. Um, like I said, Mondo Salas. There, there's so many, and I know I'm overlooking a lot of them. But uh, I'd say, you know what? I would say tell people to. It, it sounds like a sounds like a sales job, but follow me on my pages because. I, I like to shout these people out because I really I, I like to shout out the little guys that deserve to be heard because they deserve to be heard. So I will I will shout them out from time to time for sure. That's awesome because I mean that's also giving back to the music community that's helped bring you up too. And you know if you've listened to my show, you know I'm I'm a really big proponent of everybody supporting one another because guess what we can all succeed. You know, we can yeah. all have a great fan base. And if if people realize that, you know, hey, these guys can actually get along and do this. And, you know, because I know all the guys that I'm friends with, they lift each other up. It's not about the days of, oh, you know, you might get two more people coming to your show than me. Who gives a <laughs> shit? You know, and everybody jumps on everybody else's albums. Or if some, you know, hey, I got a bass player missing. Well, hey, buddy, I, I got you this week. You know, it's it's all about building that community, and the community is let's lift up the people that don't people don't everybody know doesn't know about just yet. And you are one hundred percent correct. And let me piggyback on that. <clears throat> I want every artist. And I know a lot of artists listen to this show and will continue to. I want them to to consider this. I promise you, you will you yourself will become more successful if you support other people. Because if you do the opposite, if you become a hater, people see that and word gets out and you become a pariah. People people don't want to talk to you when you're like that. The only people you'll attract are other haters and y'all yeah. are going to be stuck on Hater Island and no one's going to care about you. But if you support other people, guess what? If you if you find this little unknown artist and you, you like tweet their stuff out like, hey man, this guy's really good. He's going to be super appreciative He's going to follow you. He's going to share something of yours, and he might buy a shirt. I'm telling you, that's how it works. The more supportive you are, the more successful you will be ultimately. And, hey, Garth Brooks, one of the biggest musicians, artists of all freaking time, he's known as a guy that supports people. Like, Oh, yeah. If, if you open for <laughs> Garth Brooks and you're like – yeah, I mean, you're obviously known enough to open for Garth Brooks, but he'll like go backstage and talk to you and tell people about you and stuff like that. I mean, it's just a, it's a simple formula. Be supportive and it's going to come back to you tenfold ultimately. Well, I'm going to tell you that if you ever get the chance to, uh, open for Dallas, he, I would love that. He, uh, he's very much the same way. I've got some, uh, other guys that have been on the show that, they've opened for Dallas and he actually sat out front listening to it. And then after everybody's show, he sat down with them for a couple hours and said, all right, guys, this is what you're doing. Right. This is what you need to tweak. And this is what's going to take you to the top. And they said, it was, was the that best. three gun whiskey. Three yeah. gun whiskey said that. Yeah. yeah. They, they said that guy is so badass. He picked the closest table and just watched our show. Yep. And Dallas is that most genuine down to earth kind of guy. Seriously, I mean, hands down. I mean, this guy, he's out 90% of the time. He's driving his old Harley to the next gig because that's how he's writing those ne those new songs. And then he'll just meet up with the van and the band. I love that dude. I just discovered him. But every time I hear someone talk about him, and I've, like, researched him on, on like, outlaw music group pages and stuff, yep. everyone says exactly what you just said. And, uh, you know, if there's smoke, there's fire. <laughs> so obviously he's a badass dude and yep. that makes me want to support him even more. Yep. I want to be like that. I want to be like Dallas Moore. That's yeah, what there I you go. To be like. Cause he's, I mean, and just seriously, a down to earth, good guy and, and real, very approachable and real. And you know, that there's a lot of people could take, learn some lessons from that kind of fellow. For real, man. Like they, I can't stand the opposite of Dallas Moore. I don't want to talk to that person. I don't want to open for him. 
I don't want to. I don't want to have anything to do with them. But I want to. I want to be friends with a guy like Dallas Moore. There you go. Hey, you know what? That's a perfect way to end this show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Yeah, we got a little long winded, but you know it's always worth it when it's a good conversation. So, folks, check back in next week, and uh, I think you're going to be surprised by the next guest as well. We were young and wild and free. You never could get over me. You never used your time wisely. You wasted your best days. I guess you didn't stop and think it through. All of the damage loving me could do. I broke your heart and I broke mine too.